Good evening. I'm Joe Ross, future independent candidate for Oregon's House of Representatives, District 33, in the upcoming 2022 election cycle. Thank you for your time this evening. I hope you and those closest to you remain safe and healthy. As we look toward a new week, I wanted to spend just a little time discussing my proposed contract with Oregon, a two-episode series discussing legislation and a framework to better serve Oregonians and how to better hold elected officials accountable. In the coming weeks and months, I hope you'll continue to join me for these little fireside chats to learn more about what I stand for, the issues we are facing, and why we as citizens of the great state of Oregon can no longer settle for the status quo from our elected officials. In the 1990s, the Republican Party introduced what became known as its contract with America. Not too dissimilar to the themes of Teddy Roosevelt's Square Deal and its three cornerstones of conservation of natural resources, control of corporations, and consumer protection. The contract with America sought to bring about major paradigm shifts across a full spectrum of issues, including fiscal responsibility, public safety, personal responsibility, the American dream, national security, legal reform, and job creation and wage enhancement. Though its success has since been widely debated, I believe if Republicans had reached across the aisle and partnered with Democrats to achieve bipartisan support, it undoubtedly would have paved the way for greater accountability of our elected officials at the federal level. Which is why I'm proposing something similar at the state level that simultaneously gets at the root cause of many of our problems and holds state level elected officials accountable. If we are not achieving what has been promised to the citizens of Oregon, then change is in order. Every citizen should ask themselves, what measures do we hold our elected officials accountable? What does success look like when determining if an incumbent deserves our vote to remain in office? For many elected officials, we quite often see them point to the legislation they've passed, the state's GDP when it's growing, and the unemployment rate when it's low, just to name a few measures. I believe this defense of one's political success is overly simplistic and misses many of the metrics that actually illustrate what success looks like for everyone. A checklist of legislative to-dos every two years is not a recipe for real tangible outcomes that positively benefits the citizens of a state. This is why success for all and benefits for all should be evaluated using a broader range of measurables and we must ensure that the broadest number of people are benefiting from government actions. For example, US News publishes its annual best states ranking. It ranks each state across healthcare, education, economy, infrastructure, opportunity, fiscal stability, crime and corrections, and natural environment. The last available data that US News reported was 2018, and Oregon came in at number 27, just below average. To its credit, the state does rank first in infrastructure, getting a significant boost by its strong investments in energy. The state also received good marks for its economy and healthcare. Where Oregon comes up short includes education, opportunity, fiscal stability, crime and corrections, and natural environment. I've said it a number of times, Oregon and its citizens deserve the opportunity to live up to their greatest potential. If one further digs into these metrics, you will find that the underlying issues reveal we are far from achieving greatness for all. For example, Oregon's economy received very high marks for year-over-year -year growth. Yet that growth has overwhelmingly benefited a lim limited number of upper-income earners. Since the 2008 financial crisis, most Oregonians have seen their real wages actually stagnate, which is why when it comes to the opportunity category, ranks, you know, Oregon ranks quite low. Oregon's high marks for infrastructure, as I previously mentioned, driven largely by its energy infrastructure, for example, have less to do with what Oregon's government has done and more with the careful planning and dedication to serving its customers by the power and gas utilities in the state. Our state managed roads and bridges, however, are a very different story. Areas where Oregon continues to struggle and where Oregonians truly deserve more from their elected officials includes education, opportunity, fiscal stability, and crime and corrections. In future episodes, I will dive deeper into these specific areas, but let me briefly speak to each of them. With respect to education, our children deserve every opportunity to thrive. Teachers should be given the tools and resources to prepare our children for the jobs of tomorrow. And families must be offered resources that help better prepare their children for school. Government can't solve all of these challenges, but it ought to point the way toward a world-class education 
by making the right investments. In terms of opportunity, we've seen wage stagnation for lower and middle class households. Let me be clear. Absent tax increases in upper income earners and businesses that disproportionately compensate its executives. I, I do support the unionization of workers in hopes that this will guide the invisible hand that drives the economy. If you are skilled or semi-skilled and contribute to the overall success of a business, then you deserve to be fairly compensated. With respect to fiscal stability, Oregon seems forever hobbled by its own financial structure, including its tax structure, two-year budget cycle, and the kicker, just to name a few. Even in an up economy, the government and the legislature have struggled to balance the budget. As recently as 2017, for example, when Oregon's economy was growing, the government struggled to balance the budget, due in part to the unanticipated number of Oregonians who qualified for the Oregon for health insurance under the Oregon Health Plan because they weren't earning enough money. Another example of why the conversation needs to be about the economy. And lastly, in terms of crime and corrections, we as a state need to double our efforts to leverage more public-private partnerships to implement programs with clearly defined outcomes that uses Oregon's prison system to reform those who have either failed society or society has failed them. Furthermore, we need to align consequences with crimes that are being committed. Even things as simple as theft of packages from homeowners' doorsteps or car break-ins, no one should feel emboldened to come on to your property to steal things off your front porch. And the punishment for such avoidable acts should be steep and the judicial process ought to be expeditious. On the campaign's next episode, I will spell out my vision for a proposed contract with Oregon, providing you with a specific plan and a clear call to action that I believe will hold elected officials accountable while driving real change that achieves outcomes that benefit every Oregonian. Thank you again for your time this evening. If you found value in this video, click the like button and please share it with your friends and family. Also check out the campaign online at www.votejoefor33.com, on Facebook at votejoefor33, on Instagram at jmross0243, and on Twitter at J-O-R-O-S-S-0-2. Until next time, strive to be your very best. Strive to be and strive to help our community be its very best. And be kind to those around you. Heaven knows, small acts of kindness go a long way toward enriching the lives of others. Good night.